I want to start by thanking you for joining us for, um, today. And I also want to thank um, all the people in the room, but all the people who are, view are viewing this via live stream. Um, I'm really excited about this. I'm excited that we're going to have this great interactive um, discussion, both in the room and um, via the live stream and via social media. This is the fourth of our five listening sessions that we're conducting across the country to really learn how to communicate and use data to improve health. We look forward to really tapping the brain power in the room and across the country to really think about how data affects all walks of our life and how we can help improve our use of data where we live, learn, work, and play. And how we can do that to both work with individuals, communities, populations to deliver better health care and improve and promote healthy lifestyles. I want to especially thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for actually launching the Data for Health initiative and for bringing us all together today. One of the powerful things about these listening sessions has been that all of the people who've been in the room who don't always sit together um, and have conversations, they work with the same people and they work with different people and they work towards one goal, but they don't often get the chance to sit in the room together and have a conversation with each other. So we're, I'm really happy that Robert Wood Johnson took the time to do this and to really bring everyone to the table. Um, and I want to acknowledge my co-chair and my partner in crime, David Ross, um, who's here today. And I also want to recognize the advisory committee members who have joined us today. If you could stand and be acknowledged. Thank you. As, as a part of this process, um, we're coming to all of these listening sessions and we'll be working together to develop a report that will come out sometime in the spring. And I encourage you to come up to these people, talk to them. We want to hear your voices. We want to hear what you have to say. So the big question is, wow, since in the last several weeks, you've gone to four different cities with one more to go. Why, Ivor, did you do this? Why did you volunteer for this effort? I truly believe in the power of data. And I believe in it as a pediatrician, as a healthcare provider. I see how it works with patients and families. But I believe in it on a personal level, too. My father um, had a traumatic brain injury when I was nine years old. And we didn't have health insurance at that time. And thank God for the VA system. Um, my father was a veteran of the Korean War, and he received his care at the VA. And for all, for many, many years, we didn't quite understand. We didn't realize it was a traumatic brain injury because that's not what they called it then. He just developed a seizure disorder. Um, I went through medical school and I went through residency, not fully understanding the origin of why that happened. And then one day, there was something called Blue Button, and my family was able to download my father's medical records. And I was able to then review those medical records and then understand better the orientation of why he had a seizure disorder. And then I could better partner with his healthcare provider. Sure, we could go to a different place now, but we stay at the VA because his data is there, because his trusted providers are there, and because we have a real partnership where we can have a relationship with his healthcare provider. And I have seen the power of data for my father and how it impacts on his care. He, ha he took a seizure medication and the standard said his levels should be at a certain level, but our family knew that that level was not sufficient to control his seizures. And so year after year, he would get admitted for, seizure, for his seizures and the physician would come in and say, okay, his levels are at, you know, at the standard level. We can send him home now. And years and years we said, no, you can't send him home because that level is not sufficient for him. And it took a while before they started to listen to us after he went home and came back and went home and came back. Um, but it took the ability for us to look at the data and then point to the data after that to say, no, take a look at where he is and understand this is the new paradigm for him. So I believe very strongly in the power of data. 
So I've been very excited about how this can work on an individual level, on a community level, on a health system level, and on a population level. So that's why I'm here today. And I hope you've come into this room um, with that passion and interest in how you can work in your personal life, in your professional life, in your community, on using data for health and impacting health. So I believe there were instructions, and I hope you all entered the room following instruct the instructions, and there should be some questions on the screen behind me. Um, and before we begin, I want to invite you okay. to share with the group what you wrote. Please raise your hand, and there are people with microphones around the room, and I ask Please people to volunteer um, to tell us your name, where you're from, and what question you answered and what the answer was to your question. So, Do I see any volunteers? Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Bobby Glad, and I recently retired, and uh, I was with the Meaningful Use Program, and I uh, moved back to the Bay Area, where I lived in the 60s, so I'm, I'm glad to be sort of home. And uh, I'm a longtime analyst by trade, three times with the Medicare QIO in Nevada. And so my, I answered, well, I answered all three questions, but the first one, uh, how have you used data to improve health in your community? We did a study using uh, what back in those days was called uh, HICFA claims data. Anybody old enough to remember HICFA <laughs> claims data? Uh, it was a, a statewide uh, diabetes project uh, using Medicare claims data. And, you know, I wasn't there long enough to really know what durable benefit came from it. But even back then, you can glean a lot of good information from claims data. Uh, yeah. This was back in the early 90s. So that was my response. Anyone else? Oh. Hi there, I'm Martha Shirk. I'm with the California Endowment Health Journalism Fellowships at USC's Annenberg School. And I have introduced journalists to data that can help them understand and report on the health challenges in their communities. That's wonderful, thank you. We have a person right here. Good morning. Uh, my name is Veronica Shepard. I'm with the Bayview Health and Wellness Center. Um, I'm also... Uh, born and raised in the Bayview Hunters Point community, so I love my neighborhood, go Bayview. <laughs> I, number two is the question that stood out for me, because we have so many health disparities in our community, and we have so many community-based organizations and so many different types of committees, councils, and groups. People are accessing a lot of different things and there's no data to tell me if I sent my client or patient to this particular organization, how successful was that? Mm. We have so many councils and committees that are all trying to help the Bayview, but we're not working together. Mm. And I don't even know how successful all of these committees are for our community. So yes. that kind of data would be really beneficial for us. That's great, thank you. Hi, I'm Lenny Lesser, and I'm gonna to try to answer one and two. I'm a researcher at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, and uh, I can't say we've improved community health yet, but we just launched a website, um, ghrelin.org, that actually ranks uh, uh, chain restaurant uh, menus um, mm -hmm. to try to uh, push restaurants to offer healthier foods. and. Uh, Answer number two is if I had data of what people are actually eating at all these restaurants, I could try to push people to eat healthier foods at all these mm -hmm. restaurants in the communities that we serve. Thank you. I mean, these, are, these are powerful examples of what we really want to get at today and what we really want to talk. Uh-oh, we have one more. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shel Culp. I'm with Stewards of Change. Uh, question number three, who would you like to collaborate with to improve health in your community? I'm, uh, I'm in Sacramento, but um, I, I don't think it's sort of community specific, right? <laughs> um, uh, I would like to work with any organizations who would like to share their data. Um, and, and I'm hearing that there isn't data, but, but, but reality is I think there is data that isn't effectively shared. 
but uh, would like to work with any organizations would like to share their data to see a more holistic view of the person and of the situation. Um, you know, we, we work in these, um, what did we call it last night, the uh, cylinders of excellence or something <laughs> of that nature. We also know them as silos. Um, so we, we work in these silos of data and we don't necessarily see uh, uh, all of the factors that are operating uh, with a person or a population or a community's health. And so I would like to work with any, I mean, with any organizations who would like to um, uh, engage with other organizations to share and see a bigger picture. Thank you. So I want to do, I want to do a few housekeeping things um, and before we move on to the next stage. Um, for those of you who are following and engaging in the conversation via social media, the event is at the hashtag data for that health, that's data, the number four health. And um, Robert Wood Johnson is tweeting live on today's event. And um, we have someone in the back that will be taking photos and shooting short videos um, to capture some of the discussion. Um, so if you're not following at RWJF underscore live yet, please do to hear more about the event. Um, and we're looking forward to your valuable insights as well as those elicited in the other sessions to inform this report that I mentioned earlier and the recommendations that we'll be, that we'll be releasing in early 2015. Um, and we have some great speakers today. Um, I want to bring up um, our, our honored um, host, the Senior Program Officer Mike, uh, Mike Painter from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, my microphone working? Great. What a great audience. Excellent. Great, great. So uh, I'm Mike Painter. I work at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, thanks so much, Ivor, for those, those comments. And like you said, thanks to you and to Dave Ross for your terrific leadership as co-chairs for this, this initiative. We're so, so grateful. Um, I have a couple of tasks here today. I want to, first, I want to um, make a number of thank yous, so I'm going to go through a parade of those, so um, bear with me here. And then I'm going to underscore a couple of points, and then I'll, I'll jump out of the way and let the, sh let the show go on. Um, first and foremost, uh, I want to thank all of you guys for coming, for taking time out of your day to come and, and, and talk to us about your, your hopes and concerns about Data for Health. We're so grateful. We obviously couldn't do this without you, so thank you very, very much for coming. Um, I, like Ivor said, I just I want to underscore again how much we appreciate the work of our advisors, um, and they are all coming, um, not all of them, but um, we have a whole bunch of advisors, and um, all of them will have gone to at least two of the five meetings. That's a huge chunk of travel time out of their schedules, and we really appreciate the effort. Um, I, uh, I want to thank our local partner, uh, the Public Health Institute. Could, did, could you guys raise your hand? Or are you, there you guys go. Thank you so much for making this event a success today. We really appreciate the effort. Obviously, when you put something like this on, there are a ton of people um, um, working really hard to make it happen. So I want to um, uh, uh, recognize those folks as well. There's the, the National Network of Public Health Institutes. Could you guys raise your hand? Um, great. I am. Um, and then Burness Communications um, is doing a terrific job at making sure all the logistics are in place so everything runs smoothly. Burness team, or can you raise your hand? You guys probably, they're off doing work somewhere. Great, good. <laughs> um, we also have a Virginia Tech team uh, who are doing the hard work of gathering all of your uh, findings from the various breakout sessions and then putting those in a draft report. Could you guys raise your hand? They're over here. So what they're going to do is gather from all the five meetings, um, gather all the findings, everything that you say, and put it into an organized um, draft report and then hand that over to the advisory committee who will then mull over it, um, uh, filter it, um, add their recommendations, and then hand it back to the foundation, then we will publicly release that um, uh, report in early 2015. So please look for that. And, and again, thanks so much to the Virginia Tech team for, that, for doing all that hard work to make that happen. I have a number of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation colleagues who are here, so you guys can um, raise your hands down up front. So if you're looking for foundation people, they're here. There are a whole bunch of um, uh, people on our team working on this effort, but we're here today to, to help out. Um, and then ONC, our ONC team has uh, been have been great collaborators on this effort. Um, Cannon and Ahmed are here. Ahmed's going to talk right after I am. Uh, Karen DeSalvo has been at all the meetings, but she, it was inevitable with this busy, <laughs> unbelievably busy woman that she, she was not going to be able to make all of them. 
so she couldn't be here today, but Ahmed's going to be here, and he has a message that she's um, brought. Um, he's, he's bringing a message from her to you, so um, we'll, we'll look forward to that. Um, at all of these meetings, I've, I've started with this kind of simple, almost silly question, and I don't want to leave San Francisco out, so I'm going to do it here, too. So uh, bear with me just a little bit. Uh, so could you raise your hand if you have a, a smartphone? How about a wearable device? How about an iPad or something like that? Something like that. Okay, so uh, if live stream people, you can't see, but everybody um, had a device. <laughs> uh, so uh, the point is that these devices that we have with us um, almost all the time are bristling with sensors, all kinds of sensors. They're, they have accelerometers, GPS sensors, gyrometers, thermometers, barometers, light and proximity sensors, fingerprints, and all kinds of sensors. So, and we have them with us all the time. So in essence, we are basically becoming uh, almost human sensors ourselves. In some ways, we're sort of walking, uh, running, cycling, buying, choosing um, 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 sensors for health. And, and that's really interesting. Um, it, it, it sort of um, puts us into a, this, this grand human experiment. Because if you think about it, for the first time in human history, millions and millions of people are creating data about almost every aspect of their lives. So that is, that's sort of mind-boggling. And, and we're sort of just getting started, too, with, this, um, with these devices and the creation of this data. I, um, I came across this tweet through my tweet stream a couple of weeks ago, and I've mentioned it at um, the other meetings. And I just, I just can't get it out of my head. It's about the Google self-driving car. And um, apparently, these, these cars generate an enormous amount of data, something like 750 megabytes of data per second. This is, just to me, it seems like a lot of data. Now, I'm going to guess that none of us, I mean, even in San Francisco, none of us arrived here today in an autonomous vehicle. But they're coming. And, and so the point is that our devices are getting more and more sophisticated. We're only going to be creating more and more data from them. And so um, that's an enormous opportunity. It also presents a, a ton of challenges for us. And that's, that's the reason for our, our discussion today. I, I'm, among other things, I'm a cyclist, and so I almost always try to work in cycling in my um, talks, and so this is where I talk about cycling. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, in back in, I live in New Jersey, and so when my buddies and I in New Jersey ride, um, we would not think of riding these days without uploading the data from our rides um, to a social media site, and we all use Strava. And so I'm not exactly sure how many megabytes of data I generate on a ride, but um, it's a lot. It, it includes things like uh, where I rode, the, the number of miles I, I traveled, the elevation I climbed, the watts I pushed, my heart rate, who I rode with, who I happened to pass by on my ride. Over time, it's, it begins to tell the routes I like to ride on. It starts to give an impression of where the, the places I avoid. Um, over even a longer period of time, it starts to show my fatigue level and my increasing or decreasing fitness level, all kinds of information that's really helpful to me and to potentially others. You know, it's interesting that this past year, Portland, Oregon, used Strava data on about 20,000 cyclists in Port the Portland area um, to try to um, see if it, they could use it to help improve their cycling infrastructure. They purchased the data from Strava for, I think, something like $20,000 and experimented with it. Now, the Portland leaders could have um, invested probably millions of dollars in a study that took months or years, um, but... Um, they, or they could instead um, get access to the data that showed where their cyclists ride to ride, like to ride right now. So that seems like an, a, an easy choice, but of course there are complications with that as well. Not everyone is going to be comfortable um, with uh, um, uh, having their data sold, even for a benign purpose like um, improving cycling infrastructure. Um, also, uh, when I mentioned this story in Phoenix, uh, one of the women said, uh, and the audience um, said, that seems kind of creepy. I'm, I'm not sure I'm really comfortable with um, having an impression of where I come and go. Um, that, that, that seems to bother me. So there's lots of opportunity and lots of challenge. I mentioned um, that, uh, that I'm from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I work there. And at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we are the nation's largest philanthropy devoted to improving health and health care. And we do that by um, working with leaders like you all across the country to help build a culture of health. Um, uh, what does that mean? That means that um, once we all realize that vision, all of us will have um, the realistic hope and opportunity to live a healthy life. Or if we or, or our families um, get sick, then we'll, have, we'll be able to access the care we need when we need it. 
Now, that's an ambitious vision, obviously, but we, we believe we have a real chance to achieve it. Now, there are lots and lots of pieces that go into building a culture of health. An important one, though, is this information piece. Um, we think that, uh, obviously, people need all kinds of information um, to make the millions of decisions and community by community that they would need to make in order to build these cultures of health in, in their particular communities. Um, we, the opportunity is, as we've all been talking today, we have all this data. The problem is we don't have an ability to get the data from healthcare and our devices and all these things in to turn it into information that we can act to do this work to build these cultures of health. Now, to enable that, um, that ability to turn the data into information that we can use, that's a complicated problem, no doubt about it. Um, it is certainly a technical problem, but it is not primarily a software or hardware or even a standards problem, not, not primarily at all. And in fact, it really is a people issue. It's a community issue. And that's why we're in Philadelphia, Phoenix, Des Moines, San Francisco, and Charleston, because we really want to know what do you guys think? We, we obviously want to know what you've already done to use data for health, but we more importantly want to know what you could do, um, what you would do, what you might do, what you might not want to do um, uh, with data for health. We really want to hear your, your hopes and your aspirations, but also your concerns and your worries and even your fears about, about this, this data stuff. So all of us um, at the foundation, um, the advisors, all the staff working on, the, on, on these meetings, we're so grateful that you came today. Uh, we're, we're eager to hear um, all your hopes and concerns. We're just really eager to listen and learn. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Mike. So now it's my honor to welcome um, the Department of Health and Human Services. As, um, as, we mentioned, as Mike mentioned earlier, they have really, um, the Office of the National Coordinator has really been a partner with, this, with us in this effort, and I'm really honored that they um, have taken the time to come to every single um, session. And as um, my ne the next speaker comes up, um, I'd like to introduce to you Ahmed Haq. He is the Director of the Office of Programs and Engagement at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. And he's going to share a message from Karen DeSalvo, our Acting Assistant Secretary of Health at HHS, and also the National Coordinator for Health and Information Technology. Ahmed. Good morning. Wow, look at this crowd. I should probably lose my tie. <laughs> can't, get, can't get the DC out of me. Uh, <laughs> So I wanted to uh, thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, and also thank our uh, advisory committee for uh, very much inviting and, and making uh, us an active participants in these listening sessions. Um, these, again, my, my name is Ahmed Haq. I'm the Director of Programs and Engagement at ONC. Um, and these listening sessions have, have really allowed us to um, stay engaged with communities across the U.S. Uh, we've completed four of these sessions and very much look forward to uh, the session in Charleston uh, next week. Um, but the opportunity to speak with uh, folks like you uh, has really helped inform our work and allowed us to uh, gain perspective uh, which informs our health IT strategic plan and um, the interoperability roadmap and other initiatives for, for which we're involved. Um, as Ivor said, um, uh, Dr. Karen DeSalvo was, is unable to uh, make today's event and she very much uh, regrets that. Uh, she is the director of, of um, ONC, the national coordinator. Uh, in addition to that, um, an acting um, assistant secretary for health at HHS, but she does have a recorded message which we're gonna play right now uh, which talks about the role of HHS and the role of data uh, to improve health. So, take it away. Good morning. I'm Dr. Karen DeSalvo, Acting Assistant Secretary for Health and National Coordinator for Health Information Technology at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I wish that I could be there with you all today in person, but I want to thank you for coming out and having this important conversation about the paradigm shift to move people towards better health. And I want to thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for their leadership and interest in hosting these conversations across the country and for inviting us to join. 
Today, many people in our country just don't have the choice to be healthy, and it's our job at HHS to think about how we can use health information, not just data, but information to solve that problem. As you might know, with the passage of the High Tech Act in 2009, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT was charged with creating, maintaining, and updating a federal health IT strategic plan. And beginning this summer, we began a refresh of that plan. This was an effort that convened some 35 agencies across the government who play some role, big or small, in health IT, ranging from our HHS family like CMS and HRSA or the Indian Health Service to the Federal Trade Commission, the Department of Defense, NASA, the VA, Social Security Administration, and many more. Over the past several years since the first strategic plan was developed, adoption of health IT has steadily increased. More Americans have signed up for insurance through the Affordable Care Act, and the use of health apps and wearables have become widespread. And today, more than 1,500 hospitals send syndromic surveillance to public health departments, and 95% of jurisdictions are receiving some labs electronically. As you all know, in the Bay Area, this progress is exciting and promising. With our updated strategic plan, we envision an interoperable learning health system that looks to a place in which health information can be collected, shared, and used to improve the public's health facilitate important research, inform clinical quality measures, and care outcomes, and keep our communities healthy. And you all are key players in making that happen because you're on the ground working one-on-one -on -one with providers, patients, consumers, policymakers, public health officials, the whole gamut, and you share the vision of health where it matters in our nation's communities. Good health for everyone starts in community, in our homes, schools, workplaces, neighborhoods. So how can we use information to create social and physical environments that promote good health for everyone? And how can we make information available where and when it matters to improve and protect people's health wherever they live, learn, work, and play? Too many people today are invisible in our healthcare system. And it's each of our responsibilities to partner with one another in our communities and neighborhoods to leverage health information, not just data or big data, but long data, health information across someone's care continuum and lifespan to achieve a collective impact for better health. This isn't just about electronic health records anymore. That was the first step. It's about harnessing the power of health information to affect the health of our entire nation, every person, everywhere. To do this, we will need to level the playing field and engage consumers and their families, healthcare workers across all kinds of settings, innovators, elected officials, all of us here today to transform the way we think about health and healthcare and what that means for our communities today and tomorrow. And most importantly, we all have a role to play in designing a system that is respectful and responsive to patient needs that looks at the whole picture of health beyond health care. I know that today will be an insightful conversation, and I want to thank you all again for coming, and to thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for convening this important dialogue and helping us as we prepare our strategic plan. Thank you all. I love my boss. <laughs> so, um, my colleague, Canon Lovell, right here in the front table, he and I are here the whole day, and uh, we look forward to participating in um, all the dialogue. Um, we had an early cut of, of the attendee list, and I know I've come prepared with several questions to ask many of you, uh, which I look forward to, to doing throughout the day. But uh, again, Canon and I are here. We can answer any questions that you have uh, throughout the day. Please feel free to stop us um, during breaks or during the sessions. But uh, um, I, I hope you enjoyed that message from, from Dr. DeSalvo. And uh, I'll pass it over to Ivor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Ahmed. So this gives me a moment to breathe as I invite our panelists to come up and um, join me on the stage. And I want to take a moment to 
get an idea of who's in the audience. Um, if people who are involved in public health, um, working for public health agencies, or involved with public health agencies, could raise your hands. Wow. Thank you. Um, people are in business. Yes. People who are healthcare providers or are working with the healthcare system. Let's see, who am I missing? Administrators. Yes. Who did I miss? I didn't see everyone's hand go up. Social services. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Housing, yes. Government. Wonderful. I'm so glad we have community-based organizations. Health, oh, blogging. We need bloggers. Thank you. Um, so I want to um, thank you all for coming. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a seat here. And then I'll introduce our guests one at a time. And they will come up and present. Um, I want to thank our speakers for coming today. I'm, I'm pretty excited to hear what you guys have to say. Um, first, our first speaker is going to be Andrew Rosenthal. And Andrew is group manager for platform and wellness at Jawbone. And Jawbone is a maker of numerous wearable devices. But Andrew, is, Andrew also has a lot of other things that he's done. Um, and a lot of experience with behavior change, which we know is a really important part of this work that we're trying to do. And a really long-term focus on something that I find really passionate, use of design and technology for behavior change. Um, and the work that, and he's also an advisor to the Oliver Wyman Health Innovation Center, an advisor at South by Southwest um, Health Accelerator, and a founder of MIT's Hacking Medicine. Um, one of the unique aspects of Jawbone is that its latest devices focus on turning raw data tracked by individuals into qualitative ways to improve your health, whether that's advising you to drink more water. <laughs> Um, on days that you work out or advising you to go to bed earlier. So I'm honored to have Andrew here today. We've known each other for a, a good while to talk to us about how, the opportunities and challenges that we have with personal data <laughs> as it relates to health. Great. Thank you very much. I'm not going to talk much about Jawbone today, though. I want to talk more about data and health. I'm happy to stick around afterwards and answer some questions. Uh, I've been in San Francisco for a couple of years, and there's a phrase in San Francisco that everyone loves using. It may be getting a little bit belabored, but it's big data and it's data science. And I want to tell you about one of my favorite data scientists. This guy is from Soho. He studies population health. He looks at data. He tries to figure out patterns of what's happening given data exhaust or data trails. And in fact, he's, as many people in this room, probably a disillusioned clinician. He's actually an anesthesiologist. Now, now his name is John Snow. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of him before. The Soho he's from is not in New York City. It's in England. And it's not the year 2014. It's 1854. Cholera was breaking out throughout his neighborhood, his community. Not one across town, but the one that he called home. And he was trying to figure out the cause and I, I wrote down the quote. I want to make sure I get it right, because this would have been the title of his blog post if he were a health blogger. <laughs> the cause of the, quote, miasma in the ether. Because that was the only explanation for what was happening in his community. So he built a map. He literally took a map, what would be today a GIS, and labeled with black bars where there were incidences of disease of cholera in his neighborhood. Think of this as something closer to aggregate de-identified data, although it's on a map. It doesn't name specific families. And he looked at this, and as you probably know, he tried to figure out, is there something that these people have in common, some explanation other than the miasma in the ether, that'll help him and help the community understand what to do about this horrible disease? This is a familiar story to people, I believe, right? OK, good. My claim, my argument in the next couple minutes is that what Jon Snow was doing in 1854 is happening today in San Francisco and in communities throughout the country. And that the work that companies in the private sector are doing 
that are helping measure and aggregate and make sense of data is the natural heir, the inheritor, if you will, of this practice, of this focus on people in the community saying, what can we learn about what's happening around us to help those? So I want to show you some of the things we're doing at Jawbone. Our headquarters is about eight blocks away. We've got about 500 employees. We're a privately held company. You may know about us because we build these wearable devices. The UP3 was just announced. It's coming out this year. It measures everything from heart rate to hydration. The UP Move starts at $49.99. It's accessible, it's affordable, but it's still fun. The reason I'm showing you pictures of products right now is because our belief is if you build great products, if you design things that people love, that they invite into their lives and use every day, then you'll have the ability to help and to engage. At Jawbone, we believe that health is what happens in between doctor visits. And this is how we get there. So let me show you some things we've measured. Lenny from Palo Alto Medical Foundation says he'd love to know what people were eating every day. I think when you raised your hand and, and answered question two, that was your response. Well, we can tell you at Jawbone what people are eating because they track their food. And in fact, if you download our app, which is free in the App Store, it's up by Jawbone, or if you buy one of our products and connect it to the app, and you log a breakfast today, and there's still time, because breakfast in San Francisco is anything up until 11.30 in the morning. If you log a breakfast today, for every breakfast you log, one will be donated by Quaker Oats through Feeding America. Because Quaker has an interest in getting people to log breakfasts. At Jawbone, we want people to log breakfasts, and you can do this at no cost, and then it helps somebody else out. And what happens? Well, we can start to make sense of the data. So this is actually something that we measured. This may not seem surprising that people drink coffee in the morning and they drink decaf at dinner, but no one ever really had measured this before. If you look at CPG companies with fantastic sell-through data, they know everything that was sold out of Walmart, but they don't know when it was consumed. You look at restaurants, they can tell you what was served when, but not everybody eats at restaurants. So all of a sudden, we have a realistic sample that's broad, not perfectly represented, but broad, based on honest signals of when people are eating and consuming different types of caffeine. I think this one's fun, especially for a morning conference, but it isn't necessarily impactful from a healthcare standpoint. But then you start to think about things that are impactful in our community. This is a graph of the magnitude 6.0 earthquake that happened in August. The epicenter was Napa Valley. Now, this graph actually shows you where the epicenter of the earthquake was, Napa as opposed to Santa Cruz. The way we created this graph, though, was not by measuring the shaking of the earth. It was because people worldwide go to bed with a jawbone up on their wrist and track their sleep. And we're able to understand when people get up at 3.30 in the morning who would not have otherwise gotten up. So when you aggregate this data, you can actually recreate a chart of where the epicenter of an earthquake is simply by looking at people's sleep habits. Now, that's interesting, and frankly, it's novel. And the USGS and the White House Office of Science, Technology, Policy reached out because this is a new data source they had never seen before. But it's not yet impactful from a health standpoint. But what if I could tell you that we were able to measure the fact that people never went back to sleep? that 85% of people within 15 miles of the earthquake never went back to bed at 3.30 in the morning. This starts to become impactful. So if you're operating a school or a hospital, if you're an employer in the community and you see this chart, what does it mean? Well, it should mean, it could mean, that you should start work later the next day, that you should start classes later the next day, because it doesn't take an MD to tell you that you need to have a good night's sleep to be able to perform your best or to practice and not risk patient error. So these are the kinds of insights that are possible with data sources that simply were unknowable previously. And I argue that these sources are only knowable when pro people build products, consumer products that people invite into their lives. When we start collecting data about things that happen outside the doctor's office and not just records of when a diagnosis or a treatment was made. Jawbone can't do this alone. We can publish the data, we can share it, we can seek to engage, but it takes practitioners in the community to put it into action. This is another chart we put together. It's complex, but it looks really cool, so I love putting it up. What this shows is this shows measures of activity between weekends and weekdays over time. And it measures the activity on the y-axis based on the temperature that it was where the people were active. The darker bars show higher levels of activity compared to the lighter bars. Now, I can put this up here and talk about it, and we can all squint and pretend we know what it means. But honestly, I had no idea what it meant until someone on our data science team helped interpret it. And this is the chart that my colleague put together. What it shows is that there is an impact upon weather on activity. 
again, maybe not that novel. Now, Mike lives in New Jersey, and he said he loves cycling. I can tell you, he's less likely to cycle when it's raining out than someone who lives in Seattle and deals with that every day. So the reality is that it's expected that weather would impact activity. But what we were able to show here that no one had ever shown before is that people are more responsive to nudges or in the public health parlance, interventions are more likely to be successful based on environmental factors. And I don't mean environmental in the abstract sense, but truly environmental factors. Telling someone to go walk home from the office as opposed to taking a bike or taking a bus or taking a car, that prompt, that intervention is going to be more successful based on the weather outside. It's not surprising, but no one had ever been able to measure it before. In fact, weather matters less on the weekdays for people who commute, right? You're gonna walk to work most every day if you can, that's your usual pattern. But your afternoon walk that you may take during what we would usually think of as work hours, maybe that phone call you take outside or that one-on-one -on -one meeting you take walking around the block rather than sitting in a conference room, your likelihood to go engage and to go exercise, to go be active is a lot higher based on the weather. And in fact, on the weekends, there's a lot more, if you would think about it from an economic standpoint, a lot more demand elasticity based on weather than there is during weekdays. So what does this all mean? Well, I don't know. I'm not going to be able to change everybody's behavior. A job on our focus is getting people to walk more, sleep better, eat different foods. We're good at it. We're getting better. There's a lot of work to do. But my guess is members of the community, practitioners, providers, others out there who interact with populations every day can start looking to these data sets and trying to figure out what changes they can make. And that's why we're here. We want to partner. We can't do this all on our own. So let's talk about changes. That data scientist, John Snow, found, maybe for the first time ever, evidence showing that disease was caused by something that looks like germ theory rather than miasma. And his community made a change as a result. They took the pump handle off of the pump so that people no longer were giving each other cholera at that pump. Not surprising. But what you probably don't know is when Jon Snow graphed that cholera outbreak in his community, there was something that didn't make sense. There was a group of people that had no cholera and were living right by the pump. Turned out they worked at the brewery. And employees of the brewery had an allocation of 70 liters of beer a month that they could drink. So they weren't drinking the water. And in fact, the greatest ode to any data scientist, I think, is a pub dedicated to Jon Snow across the street <laughs> from where the pump handle once stood. Thank you. I've never heard a health reason for a pub. That was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Ronnie Zeiger. And um, Ronnie is the former chief health strategist at Google, where he led efforts ranging from Google flu trends to system search. In 2012, he, 12, he left Google and started Smart Patients. Um, Smart Patients is an online community of patients and caregivers that seeks to amplify the knowledge created by networks of engaged patients. It's that peer-to-peer -peer thing. We are fortunate to have him with us today to talk about how individuals and families can use data to make informed decisions to improve their health and the quality of their, of their life, as well as data contributed by individuals, how it can, um, data contributed by individuals can influence healthcare delivery and public health preparedness. Thank you all for having me. Um, I'm sort of gonna talk about that. <laughs> um, this is gonna be a little bit more uh, autobiographical than what I'm usually comfortable talking about. Um, uh, it's not a picture of me. So um, I'm, a, I'm a data nerd. I love data. Um, in most audiences, that would be something of a confession, obviously not, not here. Um, I, I grew up loving math and, and then science. I, I decided that probably the most interesting secrets in the world uh, lay somewhere in biology, and, and I bet on molecular biology, what was happening uh, at the time with the beginning of genomics. Um, uh, and, and in college, I spent a lot of time in labs. And I learned how to splice DNA and make um, antibodies that were half mouse, half human, that could trick the blood-brain barrier and, and um, potentially give us access to new drugs. And it was absolutely um, 
fascinating and exciting and a little bit lonely. Uh, the lab turns out to be um, a place where you're looking down more, more than up. And, uh, and so I, I then discovered medicine and found out that, wow, you can actually do science and, and people at the same time, data and humanity. And, and wow, the data. Um, I, I was the guy in the medical school class who first had the Palm Pilot and taught everyone else how to use it. And I learned how to write computer programs because the medical center was creating so much data. And obviously, the, the low-hanging fruit was, how do we make sense of this? How do we make it so that it's not simply a pile of data getting larger and larger? And uh, I, I practiced medicine, and I got a degree in medical informatics to sort of cement my uh, data nerd identity. And um, I continue to see patients. Um, that sort of keeps me grounded in a way that I think I'm just beginning to understand and maybe will become clear to me and you uh, during this conversation. Um, and that seemed to be especially true when I went to work at Google. And, oh my god, the data. Um, I, uh, I studied what people across the globe were putting into the Google search box. Drugs and symptoms and diseases and supplements, uh, test results, good news, bad news. And I started to see that behind each of these searches were, were people. And, and their searches, this data, was starting to put together a story if we could only connect the dots. The data that we were seeing is really just a projection, a shadow of these rich, complex stories. And sometimes we can connect the dots. Uh, sometimes it's the kind of thing that, that a child might be better at telling us than, uh, than we can recognize ourselves. In this case, happens to be one of my children. So the, the simple thing that I want to tell you here, and I look, get, look forward to talking a little bit nerdier um, during the Q&A, is that we absolutely need more data. And we need better access to our data. And we need to more carefully elicit and listen to the stories behind the data, because it's the stories that tell us which questions to ask. The data may give us the answers, but the stories will tell us which answers matter and why. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gary Wolf. Gary is a journalist, blogger, and <laughs> co-founder of Quantified Self. It's an international collaboration of users and makers of self-tracking tools. Am I getting this right? Absolutely. All right. Um, through, conference, through conferences, community forum, and online guides, Quantified Self really helps people to get meaning out of their data. So I feel like what, Ron, what, what Ronnie said is going to flow right into what Gary's going to talk about. So. Great. Right. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ronnie. That was, I couldn't agree with you more. And, um, and I think it gets left out. So um, I, I, um, I have so many things I want to talk with this group about. And I'm glad we have the day. Um, because right now, I'm just going to talk about one thing, which is uh, access. Um, you know, this uh, theme today is data for health. And that's in the context of a larger theme that the Robert would Johnson Foundation has framed, it's been very useful for me and for my colleagues um, in the culture of health. The culture of health is sort of a powerful framing um, because it puts the question of health into the context of the broadest questions we have about ourselves and our community. So I think data for health, if you read it as a kind of shorthand for data for culture of health, starts to change the way we think about data both what it is, how it flows, and what it's for. 
So we know that data is really useful for us. Um, we know it's useful for managers and scientists who use it to do calculations so they can better understand, model, make decisions that affect many of us. But data has another purpose, and that purpose is growing in significance. Data is useful for us. Data is useful for self-care, for self-discovery, and even for self-expression, for connecting with others who may share something in common with you, be able to help you, or whom you may be able to help. Now, seven years ago, we started a project called The Quantified Self. And our job, the job we gave ourselves, was to support people and learn with people about themselves and about ourselves using our own data. That project has grown a lot. There's over 110 groups in over 30 countries. Our local group here in the Bay Area has more than 4,000 people in it. But that's actually very small. It's not a big project. It's a small project at the scale people think about when they think about a culture of health, especially our friends in public health and community health. Think about numbers which are far, far bigger than the numbers of people who today are involved in the quantified self movement or even more broadly in quantified self practices. But what we witness, I think, is a pointer towards a new understanding of data for a culture of health because we see people using their data for the most consequential human purposes. Whether they're attempting to achieve a goal, a personal goal, a learning goal, a fitness goal, whether they're valiantly managing a, a chronic disease or caring for others, or whether they're simply driven by a fundamental human curiosity to understand themselves and to understand their communities and support their communities, data matters to them. We talk a lot about big data in our worlds, um, and especially here in the Bay Area. There's something not quite right about big data as a concept. I myself have looked into where did this idea of big data, what is big data, what does it mean? You know, people say, well, you need a supercomputer. Well, that's obviously not what it means. Um, you can do big data on small computers. It turns out that really big data is an idea that's inherited from the idea of big science. So that's what we mean by big data. We mean big data is useful to do big science. And the bigness of the data may be a little bit beside the point. What I've come to be interested in when I think about data for a culture of health is not big data or small data, but our data, a kind of personal data. Data that's personal, not just because it's generated by a person, the way weather data is generated by the weather, or astronomical data is generated by radiation from the stars, but because it's for the person. It's by us and it's for us. And if we're going to build a culture of health, I think we have to pay attention to the aspirations, kind of the democratic and personal aspirations that are implicit in the idea of data for a culture of health. Now, access. There is a barrier, and it's a very serious barrier. Sometime you are going to go out and try to learn something about yourself with your own data. If you haven't already, you're going to want to consult the data, data either that you've entered into an app that you like, or data that's been gathered about you through any of the many various technical systems that you participate in every day. You're going to want to take a look at that data, and you're going to find that you can't. Not only do you have no legal right to look at that data in most cases, but there isn't even an informal consensus that you should have access to the data. And I think we often encounter in our discussions a lot of difficult technical questions about how you provide access to data, what the legal guarantees of access to data would be. But I'm here to tell you there isn't even a, a kind of common understanding that access to your data is good. And so we're starting from the very beginning. And I want to frame a kind of challenge to access, a cultural challenge to access, that I encounter all the time. Because while I have one foot in the quantified self movement, I have another foot in science and in journalism and in the technical culture that we all live in. 
And that is the idea that data access for us and our communities is beside the point. That thinking about ourselves with data is the privilege of a very small group of people who have the luxury, the inclination, and the ability to reason with data. Often that objection is presented in a very compassionate tone of voice. Let's help people get to what they really need and what they really want without bothering them with all of this reasoning and all of this uh, kind of thinking. That is a barrier to access, and that is a barrier to a culture of health because it contains within it all the stereotypes about people who are disempowered and about our own disempowerment when we want to understand ourselves better. I don't have time and we don't have time at this moment to really explore the nature of those stereotypes and the nature of those objections. But if I have one thing to do in my introduction, it's to put that on our agenda today and ask who has the ability and the skill and the right to reason about themselves with data? Is reason a kind of human birthright, or is it the privilege of a few? I can't wait to talk to you about that. I know some of my friends are here who have a lot to say about that, and I'm excited for the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. So this is, the, this is what I call the fun part of this. This is when the question and answer um, session comes on. And we'll be asking people in the audience um, to give us their questions. I'm going to kick it off, because we, we also have people who are um, watching live stream who've already started sending us in questions. So I'm, I'm just going to dig right in. Um, I, I get to take the privilege as a moderator to sort, sort of start this conversation. One of the things that Karen said in her video was, you know, we talk about this as data, but it's really about information. Because sometimes it, it brings to mind what you talked about, Gary, when we start talking about access to data. When we, when we limit it to a term of access to data, we're thinking, you know, we limit it to sort of people who we feel should be able to process that data. But when we start talking about information um, and the use of information for health, in, really for life, that broadens the scope of the conversation and for us to really start thinking beyond the bounds of who we typically think of as the quantified people participating in the quantified self movement. So I'm going to ask you to sort of, even though you cut it off to bring it, <laughs> to do it anyway. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try not to just turn it back to you because I do think these are sort of master level questions and by master level I don't mean just for a few masters. I mean for us all to try to achieve a little bit more mastery in how we talk about data and how we talk about information. But a few things just to offer. We think of data and even information as a flow that goes kind of from the holder, from the store, from the silo, out into the world. It doesn't really look like that, and I can tell you it doesn't even really look like that technically, because we've gotten very deeply into researching the flows of personal data around different systems. The mental model of what happens with data information has to be almost as complex as a theory of society, like who participates and how do people participate. And so what we're asking for when we ask for access to data has to do with what are the systems that enable us not just to learn, but also to act? Are we empowered to act on the data that, and the information that we have? Today, there's larger trends that help us here. You don't have to be affiliated with a major research institution to consult the literature. And people who have, say, diagnoses often do consult literature to learn about their situation. So you have access to knowledge. You don't have to be in a big city um, to participate with a widely distributed group of peers who care deeply about the same topic as you, so we can learn from each other. And finally, you don't have to be in a lab to make accurate measurements. Like that used to be very, very hard to do. And now we can make accurate measurements. All of this points to a new kind of knowledge making. Mm -hmm. And it's that, rather than sort of just transfer of information, that I think is the goal to get to a culture of health. We're changing the way we learn together. But that's not ex an excuse for letting the data flow out of your silo into that system, because that system has to be fed. And one of the things it's fed by is a very literal 
kind of, I want to have my data in a convenient format so that I can share it with my, you know, caregivers or with my peers or put it into a search engine or something like that. And I think this also talks a little bit from the work that Andrew is doing and how we can think about um, the use of data in different ways um, and how their overlaps. One of the things that I was thinking about when you were talking about people being awake um, with the earthquake, it's like, what about the crime levels in my neighborhood and how does that impact my sleep cycle? Right. Um, and, and what correlations are there? So, so many other ways to think about how we can use information. And there's so many populations who are not connected to a health system. And here we, in San Francisco, we have a great opportunity to talk about information and data beyond the EMR and beyond the healthcare system to inform how we improve health and life for people. Yeah, I mean, Assistant Secretary DeSalvo started off this morning by saying too many people are invisible in the system. And that's something that, I mean, for those of us who have followed her trajectory and her commitment, that's something that she's wanted to change. That's part of why we're so excited for this transition she's been able to undergo uh, for her new roles. So if too many people are invisible in the system, the question becomes, are we scoping the system the right way? If it's the capital H health system, then sure, people who don't have access to care are invisible. Or people who haven't been admitted for something going really wrong are invisible. But if we think about the health system as the things that contribute to the cultures of health, then there are a lot of other ways we can go pick up on those traits. So to be really concrete, I mean, Think about the places in the community where there are interventions. It's not just the hospital. In fact, most times it's not in the hospital. It's the basement of the church. That's where Alcoholics Anonymous meets. That's where you know, support groups for people with diabetes meet sometimes. Knowing where churches are in a community could be a really valuable indicator of the ability of that community to support and to enhance health. I don't think we usually uh, categorize church locations as data that matters for health and right. for systems. So, Part of the benefit of being a privately held company, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, you know, a, a profit-driven company is that we're incented to go figure those things out and find those new data sources. Because if we can create value there, then we can thrive. So part of the benefit of having private company come together with the, with the public sector and with foundations and those, you know, watching and tracking and writing about what's happening is that we can move a lot faster than if we rely on the traditional system that only needed data to go do what it was supposed to go do. Churches never mattered if you were supposed to be submitting bills and getting reimbursements. But they do matter if you're trying to figure out the best places to roll out interventions or the best places to bring the community together. So that's an example, I think. Oh, that's great. Um, I have a question from Patrick Rowe. Um, regarding data from devices, the people we need to reach, the poor people with chronic diseases, don't use these apps or wearables. Should the emphasis be placed on getting these people cheap wearables for collecting data? No. <laughs> Sorry. Was that, thank you. Did I say it out loud? <laughs> so I think we have to ask the, ask the question, what, what problem are we trying to solve and for whom? Um, too often when we're, talk, when we're having conversations about data, we're talking about the problems that we have uh, in this room or that we perceive as our problems. And, and we're not focused enough on what the perception of the problem is of that member of that community who is underrepresented in the wearable sector. Yeah. Um, one thing that strikes me, a, a parallel comment I'll make, is that, and I don't pretend to know what his or her problem is, but uh, I think it's a waste of time to talk about whether or not we should make it easier for her to access a wearable before figuring out what does she care about? What's her problem from her perspective? Um, a transition which I would like to see happen is that we ask people as often as we're asking them to share their data, to share their story. When you say, hey, do you feel comfortable sharing your data? Whoa, you know, that's, that's, that there's, a, there's a bunch of subtext that makes us uncomfortable. Um, hey, will you share your story with me, with us? Oh, well, that's, that sounds like what people do. And, and, I, and, and they're, of course, not even remotely mutually exclusive. In fact, they might even be the exact same exercise, but with a different framing. 
and it gets back to what matters to people and what their perspective is. It, I mean, the power of story is so important to inform us in how we serve people. When people come into my office, as you know, when people come into your office, they share a part of their life with me. They, they, open up to, they open up to us. And you talked about this, when people wear a device, or however they do it, they're sharing their life with us. And that's in, in us learning from that life experience and that story and how we can serve better, to me, I think, is the value of how we use data or whatever we use or whatever we choose to use to improve health. Um, I have another question from Eileen Lukes. She says, I'm a nurse epidemiologist and recently retired. Data analysis is my passion, but those who have data are reluctant to share data with, volunteer, with volunteers. Retirees have a wealth of information, um, but they don't want to work full time. How do we recapture this resource? And I think this. I, I can't help. Uh, share a quick anecdote. Um, uh, at, at Smart Patients, we just started a new, um, a new, a new experiment um, with building a clinician-facing site, where um, where it's it's essentially a case-based learning system, where the cases, if you will, are taken from our patient-facing site. So we curate cases and we ask patients, hey. Um, could we use this de-identified copy of your story for, for teaching purposes in this particular context? Um, we're, this is very early. It's only actually a couple weeks old. But so far, zero people have said no. Yeah. That's great. So I'm going to open it up for questions in the audience. Can we, I think we have people with microphones going around. You have to raise your hand. Raise your hand. Hi. Don't be shy. I have someone right here. And please remember, for those of you who are um, listening online, to please send in your questions. As you can see, I am happy to ask them. Hi, Lenny Lesser again. Um, so I'm a researcher. I'm trained in research. And I'm trained in looking at uh, a quality of data and research that's necessary to make a public health or medical recommendation. And um, researchers think we have the expertise in that. And researchers and public health people also think they have the best ways to collect data. In reality, some of the people in the other sectors, in the for-profit for sectors, have better ways of collecting data than we do. Um, but maybe some of their data isn't as rich. Or, or maybe it's just as rich, but not of the quality of data that we need to make a research and public health recommendation. And having recently purchased some data from a for-profit company, I can see that it's kind of messy and not the data that I would collect if I was a researcher. So my question is, how do we blend the, what these great companies are doing to collect data from all these different people in innovative ways with really good methods on the research end to get the quality of data that we need to make public health and medical recommendations? So, I mean, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, I spent a number of years in the academic world, sat on an institutional review board, reviewed, you know, world-class protocols, and there's absolutely something to be said for the levels of precision and accuracy demanded by the, you know, peer-reviewed cycle. That said, one of the world's world-class sleep labs, I won't name the institution, it's in the South Bay of the Bay Area, one of the world's world-class sleep labs is in the state of California. Jawbone has more sleep data than they will ever have. <coughs> So you can go get wired up to all the right machines, all the right monitors in a sleep lab, and go have your sleep pattern studied. But it's not your real home. You probably drove from for a couple hours at least to get there. You're not sleeping alongside the people you usually sleep with. You don't have the same distractions. So it's incredibly precise data down there. But I don't know how accurate it is if what we're trying to do is measure the impact of crime in the neighborhood. So my call, my request would be that we look for opportunities for data fusion, to take data from multiple sources, sometimes with varying levels of precision and accuracy, and figure out what patterns we can extract when we layer them on top of each other. Because that's where the opportunity is. And previously, that wasn't rewarded much in the academic world. Now you look at what happens at um, HealthMapper out of, I think HealthMapper is out of Harvard, uh, really looking at raw data sets, messy data, fuzzy data, missing data, but they're able to extract Ebola 
outbreak indications long before the traditional measures can. And I think we're seeing examples in the academic world of data fusion happening and being rewarded, and that's critical, because if we want good advancement in science, we need to figure out how the institutions of academics can reward, promote, give tenure to people doing good work with non-traditional data sources. As an academic in that space, I like to remind people, you know, data life is messy, and we need to work with people where they are in life and learn to deal with that messy if we're going to be able to help people. I believe there's a question over here. Hi, Kathy Kim from University of California, Davis. I want to go back to a comment that you made, Dr. Horn, that you okay. discovered something about your father's condition when you got blue button access to his medical records. Mm -hmm. And then Gary said, the problem is access. We don't have a fundamental um, access to the data that we already have, much of which is in, um, in clinical settings. Patients don't have fundamental access to that. Um, and so how do we solve that problem? Um, because I think that is or to making any of these other kinds of changes and solve the access problem, give people the information that they need, and allow them to make the kinds of inferences they want about their own clinical conditions, then that kind of learning will help us to understand all this other community data that we might also access further down the road. Kathy, if you don't say it, I'm going to quote you, so go ahead and say it. <laughs> like, um, I mean, we were talking before, and she said the person is the integrator. And that is a profound model, and it gets to the question about how we handle data quality. Because one way to handle data quality is just to pile up the data, <laughs> aggregate even more data. But actually, a lot gets lost, like at each stage of aggregation. And we've, we've kind of mapped like data flowing from Azumio to RunKeeper, and from RunKeeper to the HealthGraph API, and from the HealthGraph API to another. And you just watch it lose quality, because you watch the provenance of the data just vanish. Like it, it, it evaporates like a volatile liquid. But actually, the person could stand up and raise their hand and say, like, OK, I'm, you know, I'm permissioning you on my data for this purpose if the person had access to the data. But actually, it's easier to aggregate it by buying it from a company than it is to kind of permission it from the individual. And a lot gets lost. So there's, this, is a, this is a social engineering kind of not a technical engineering, and it's related to a shift in our culture of who we understand that data is coming yeah. from. And I think the person is the integrator of the, the data and the analysis of the data. They're also the integrator of, they're the integration hub between different people in the clinical setting mm -hmm. because it doesn't go between the cylinders of excellence. So the people actually have to take their records from place to place to place. So I think they play two different roles, and that access is critical in both. Yeah. Thank you. Can, can I part with Matthew Holt from the Healthcare Blog and Health 2.0? And I want to pile in on exactly this point. And that's, <laughs> while we're piling in, I just had uh, my knee MRI scanned at short, vast expense at UCSF. And I finally went onto my chart. And can I download anything? No. Same thing is true. So Paul Tang at uh, Palo Alto Medical Foundation has put Blue Button into their version of Epic's My Chart, My Record. But literally, even if you are a really passionately involved person like me who wants to get your data out of these different systems, it's freaking impossible. And what we should do, you know, it's great to talk about all the stuff you guys talk about, Ronnie turning stories into data, and Gary talking about the quantified self, and getting stuff from your sleep data, and you know, I should be wearing mine, but I lost it, you know. Um, but the data that actually matters, the small data that, we ha that matters about what was the condition the kid had, what were the drugs the diabetic was on, that kind of data, it's all there, it's locked in silos. We've spent $25 billion of the Chinese taxpayers' money putting, that, putting those systems into place to get it. And what, part of what RWJF and California Healthcare and everybody else in the room should be doing is naming and shaming the people who've just got it bottled up in silos and are not doing anything about it. Because it's just, you know, we spent the money. We shouldn't be sitting around saying, well, it's tough and I have to move my data from one place to the other. We should really be getting very aggressively personal about this. And I would love to find someone to sue. And my only concern, <laughs> I, I'm not joking, I would love to find someone to sue. My only concern is that I didn't realize this until Health 2.0 when uh, Jacob Ryder told me that it's not view, download, and transmit. It's view, download, or transmit. So as long as they give you a view into some data, <laughs> they've done their part in a meaningful use, and it's all good stuff. And Sorry. take your $25 billion and go home. <laughs> so I'm really mad about this. And I think collectively, as a room, we should get mad. Let's, let's march out and just transform this. Because I really agree the activist piece is so, in, yeah. So here, here's the thing. That march is going to be a lonely one. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so I got I got an MRI actually at Paul Tang's shop, um, not too long ago, and I noticed something very interesting. Um, Matthew knows a lot about my my trajectory. 
Um, I'm one of the, I'm, 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 I'm the choir that's being preached to about this kind of thing. And I left the Palo Alto Medical Foundation after my MRI, and I was driving home, and I said, wait a second, I didn't ask for my data. Oh my God, you know, I almost, I almost exploded. <coughs> and, and I realized that the reason I didn't ask for my data is because I know where it is, and I have a sense of the likely scenarios when I might need it, and I'll be able to get it then. So this is not, that, that's, not that's kind of mundane, but, what, but the point that I'm trying to make is, is that there is a tiny minority of people like you, Matthew, who actually give a crap about their data. And we, we organize a march on Washington. There's going to be like seven of us there, and no one's going to care. And so there, there, there needs to be much more clarity to the end users, to the people who aren't already believers and aren't insiders in this little world industry that we've, that we've created, and which I love, and I hang out in every day, and I, have, I, love my, I love my job. I wouldn't do anything else. But it needs to become more clear, hopefully through exercises like this tour, this beautiful tour, Five City Tour, um, that we can turn around and explain to more people why they should want their data. Maybe even enhance our understanding of it, because I'm not totally clear yet. But until we can get many more people to join that advocacy movement, um, we can't expect the stakeholders who uh, pay attention to uh, dollars or peer pressure or lawsuits or whatever it is, they shouldn't do much yet because not that many people seem to care. I mean, building on what Ronnie's saying, and I think Matthew's fine with lonely marches from what I know about him. He's okay being the only one <laughs> raising his hand early on and saying this isn't right. Building on what you're saying, it's not just about the data. I mean, I think we've got a phrase at, at, at Jawbone which is data is nice, but understanding is better. People fundamentally don't want to know how many steps they walk day in and day out. It's a great thing to get started with. We notice people get very engaged from the beginning. But after a couple months, or after the knee is properly healed, the question that people want to have answered is kind of, so what? What should I do differently tomorrow so I feel better than today? How should I take care of a loved one differently tomorrow so he's discharged from the hospital faster the next cycle? And that's why this emphasis that I think has historically been there on just accessing the data has been so insufficient. What's exciting to me, based on the people that I heard talking this morning, people who stood up in the room, is so many of us are focused on transforming data into information and into meaning. So I think we can put pressure on those driving incentives. I think we can put pressure on our care providers and on those holding on to data to help us make meaning out of it. Um, and I, I, there's a lot of, I mean, that's what's happening. That's why there's millions of people worldwide using, using the Jawbone system. Right? I mean, it's not just because they paid for it. Because a lot of times you pay for things, you stop using them. It's because we're training it into meaning. We're helping you understand the impact of switching time zones and how poorly you sleep for the following days. Mm -hmm. Helping you understand the impact of having caffeine before going to bed and how poorly you sleep. It's the making meaning thing that I think is starting to get judged by the market. And I'm encouraged by that. Yeah. We have a question in the audience. So my question is for all of the panel, and it's from a lens as a community-based organization, as a person who lives in the Bayview Hunters Point and particularly deals with African American health. We have tons of data, tons. We have so much data, it's overwhelming. And yet, I still get calls or people contacting me to get more UC interns or people doing residencies or want to call me about more information and more data. Yet, our health disparities have not shifted to a positive outcome. They're getting worse. So my question to you all is, what's professionally or politically correct to say, I don't want to do this anymore because we're still sick and we still have huge inequities. At what point do we say, we've got enough data, when do we go to the resolve? <laughs> and how do we as, like myself, community-based people, can't access all this information that people are all collecting, and we're struggling just to stay afloat as entities. It just There's an appearance that there's a whole lot of information, there's a whole lot of data, a lot of people are getting paid, but we as African Americans are still very sick. So what good is this? 
I, I have something to say to that if no, if, because I think that's the point. I mean, I, to me, that's the core problem. And I think if you, you, we have to, I mean, people who are here in this discussion are here because we want to make change on a, on a, on, at some scale, small or large. And I think we have to get into this question of data. What is this thing that is supposed to exist and that's supposed to be meaningful? And it turns out that a lot of it is just feeding a kind of process, an analytical process that's disconnected from health and from a culture of health. So changing that, if you're talking about changing that, which I think we are, you're talking about cultural change. You're talking about social change. And that is, you've got to have a complex mental model. You have to have a big view of the world to allow yourself to talk about social and cultural change. You're not talking about, we need, you know, we need to open this particular database. One of the reasons that we see in, in talking with hundreds of people over seven years about the use of their data, the thing that's the most discouraging about kind of something called data is that you don't actually have the power in your life to make any change that's relevant to improving the thing that you see in the data. So right there, you're talking about a culture of uh, data for a culture of health has to go all the way to, well, what power do you have to actually act on this data? For instance, you may know about Propeller Health, which is putting GPS-enabled uh, asthma inhalers out in the world, which will give you a time and a location when that asthma inhaler is used. Now, there are parents in every community who would like to know what triggers that childhood asthma incident. That is not a kind of question of privilege. That is a question of parenthood, and it's everywhere. OK, but what power do you have? to do something about the fact that, you know what, it's at school. Whenever, whenever he goes to school, that's where we see the asthma incident. Well, what's the next step? And I think we're going to get right there super fast if we take seriously the question of data for a culture of health. We're going to get right to, well, what are we learning on the ground level and what power do we have to change it? It's very challenging if you're thinking technically, because like, that seems like a really like, a hard problem. We'd rather solve a technical problem. But there's no point solving a problem that isn't the real problem. So. I, su I suspect that, that, that's, that's, that what you just said is going to be the most important question asked all day. Um, and thank you for it. It's also a little bit embarrassing because I don't think we have a great answer. One small suggestion I would make is that when you are invited to collaborate with someone in that way that you described, um, that, you should feel, that you should feel that it's absolutely appropriate and politically correct to say, can we take half a step back and talk about what problem you're trying to solve to make sure we're on the same page about that. Um, to be cynical about it, in many cases, the problem they're trying to solve is um, to uh, publish something or to achieve, achieve what we would call a surrogate endpoint from your perspective, something that, frankly, you don't necessarily care that much about. And, um, and there needs to be better dialogue about that. Um, and what I suspect would happen in some, with some of those conversations is that uh, you might help some of those people who have skills that you don't better understand the problems that they're trying to solve, and you would become collaborators in a way that neither of you have necessarily imagined yet. Ronnie, I think you bring up something that's, um, I thank you for your question. Um, as a long-term health disparities researcher, watching the numbers um, get worse in asking the question, so what? I think one of the things that we talked about, one of the things that Karen mentioned, um, is how do we take this information and move it towards action? Um, and I think it goes beyond sort of people, um, people coming to fulfill their needs, but coming to ask the community the question, what do you need? Um, and how can we better serve you? Um, and how can we better partner with you to address those health dis to address those health inequities that you see every day? Because like she said, there's a lot of data. Um, and sometimes it means going in, and we've talked about this in other sessions, getting, getting from um, the point of looking at data to say what's the matter to getting to data that says what matters. Um, and that's, and that's, a, that's a shift. That's a really different mindset and a different thought process because if we start asking people what matters and start answering those questions, it goes, it goes out instead of it's not about us, it's about the people who, who we need to serve. And the whole purpose of this looking at data for health is 
on the individual level, yes, looking at and doing things in terms of data for health, but it's also about serving communities who don't have resources and don't have the capacity to do things for themselves necessarily. And I think we want to continue and make sure that we continue that conversation um, and call people to the carpet and call people to action, call business, call academia, call health systems to action for those people who come into their, their doors and those people who don't. So. so just an anecdote, which I think is kind of fascinating. It, you, you can look this up, but there was a thing that broke out in the LA school district last year where there's a big grant to provide uh, iPads or some kind of computer, computing in the school. And the staff and the students started to take pictures of the condition of the school and post them, including the um, water fountains and the bathrooms. And if you don't think the condition of a water fountain and a bathroom in a school is a public health um, issue, then you know we missed the whole point that from the 19th exactly. century there, and so that's a direct like the the, the bottom up um, feed of the conditions of on the ground in a sense can be very powerful. In this case, perhaps just merely embarrassing to the administrators, but hopefully a step in the right direction. It told a story. It told a story. <laughs> we have we have a question in the back and then a question up front. Good morning. Thank you. I'm Melanch Matthews with the Public Health Institute. I want to follow up on Veronica's comment a little bit about the challenges that I've seen for many years. It's not so much uh, foundations, government agencies dropping into a neighborhood where we see substantive health disparities, but the challenge for data that we've seen in San Francisco and is seen across the country is the sharing of data inside government agencies and the definitional parameters of data. So the Department of Children, Youth, and Families tracks youth at X age, 16, 18, 24. And sometimes those boundaries are set because they're chasing philanthropic dollars. Sometimes they're set because they have um, statewide or federal tracking mechanisms, whether it's any Casey's Children's Kids Count, or whether it's state tracking numbers, or whether it's CHIP, or OSHBIT, or anything else. And then you've got the truancy numbers, then you've got the daycare numbers, then you've got the low-income housing fund numbers. And one of the things that we've seen in the city here for many, many years is the real, real challenge that comes along with protection of privacy, ways to share data across agencies, government agencies. I don't see a lot of need for folks to drop back into community and say, what do you need and how can we be good partners? The real the real bullocks that we've had in so many communities is the uh, leadership at the highest possible levels to um, attribute data that works for the same community or the same set of, of families so that social services and truancy and child care and the police department and everybody can share some level of common uh, definition and common data that allows families to not be jumping across 17 different hoops and allows us to make long-term investments. Because having data and making it actionable to make community change that is sustainable change is a substantive investment and it's not a three-year grant. And that's really what's true right now when I sit here and think about data. <coughs> I really had some stuff I wanted to talk about, privacy and liability and 23andMe and all that, but then I had to just say, you know what, I've been sitting with this, and 25, 30 years ago, we started the Healthy Cities movements internationally, and now it's become de rigueur with more payers and the ACA of population health and that shift from pu public health to pop health and total population health, and what does that mean and how do we use that data? And it is this moment in time that we have right now with the resurgence of a new narrative about what it takes for sustainable community health mm -hmm. and data and health. And obviously RWJ's investment has been substantive and understanding of the need for data. You didn't name it data and technology, although we're talking about tech tricks. It's data, and for me, one of the biggest challenges is really the investment in government to help um, really move the data that we have and the long-term investment in community. Thank you. I think that's such an important statement. I mean, this is not about a funding cycle. Um, Mike said it early on, this is a long-term process. This is a long-term commitment. 
And I think it's important for us to make, to make those statements and to understand that. I, thought, I think I saw another question. Oh, I have one up here and then up here and then there. You read my mind. So, um, yeah, it, coming from the government perspective, um, given that we, there seems to be a consensus in the room that health data is not simply your electronic medical records. However, um, when we think about all of our social services, they face a patchwork of regulations and laws um, that are inconsistent, certainly not harmonized, and vary across the local, state, and federal levels. Um, to what degree do you think uh, regulations are keeping up with the need to use data, not just within governments and within social service systems, but then when it comes to this access point in terms of individuals being able to access their data, given that the data are they're created within silos and they're regulated within silos. So I, th I think as someone who's a huge disappointment, my mom never been to medical school or law school. I'll answer just as, as, as someone in a private company. Um, I think that really good design is a very powerful counter to out-of-date and archaic regulation. It doesn't solve everything. But when you build great products, services, solutions, and people invite them into their lives, they start using them, living with them, literally going to bed with them, they will find ways to access, share, and start to make sense of data that are more powerful than what people had been thinking about and regulating around and, and trying to predict decades ago. It's not going to solve everything, but it's a great place to start. And it allows us, when we do that, to look for examples of innovation around the edges and to hold those up in conversations like today and to ask, are we holding things back? Do, do rules need to be changed? We have time for one more question. No pressure. <laughs> Uh, uh, my name is Daniel Stein. I'm with uh, Stewards of Change. I'm also one of the advisors who's been to four, this is the fourth event that we've been to. And I've been the squeaky wheel a little bit here. Uh, 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 even around um, the, the, the title of this, which is uh, Data for Health, and uh, my uh, uh, broken record has been, I think we need to expand that out because I think the semantics of the word health are difficult or potentially difficult, because I think it, it implies health care. And I think what we just heard a little while ago about social services in the community is that we're really talking about health and wellness in many ways, or health and well-being, and health and social well-being, those kinds of things. And I think that we have to be careful of thinking about health and health care on one side of the spectrum, because the other side, which is wellness, which is when you're not in an institution, you're not in a facility, you need to pay attention to that. And then that brings up guess what we talked about is the social determinants of health. So what I would encourage us today to talk about is to think, make sure that we're thinking about the larger context of wellness and social well-being with health as a component of that in our conversations uh, as it goes along today. Because we get very much into data around health and healthcare data. And uh, to, to your point over here, we, you can't get your, if you're a kid in foster care, you can't get your data, right? And what matters is, health, of course, but all the other stuff around you, your housing, your education, your safety in your community, all those kinds of things. And if we're not paying attention to that, we're only at a piece of the equation here. So, leave you with that. Thank you. Um, this has been a rich discussion. I, I apologize to the people who are live streaming and who sent in questions and we didn't have a chance to, um, to get to your questions. So. But I want to thank everyone for their time. We're going to shift um, to our breakout sessions now. And I want to thank our panelists for a lively and energetic discussion um, this morning. So this is where I, I play a bit of traffic cop. And I put on my moderator hat and my um, tour guide hat. Um, we're going to. Um, have five breakout session, five breakout groups, and each group will focus on a different topic. And we will have facilitators in each room who will guide the discussion. And we'll run each session twice, once before lunch and once after lunch. Each person in the room um, is assigned to two breakout rooms, one per session. And um, your assignment should be on the back of your name badge. The letters correspond to the room, which are listed on the agenda. And the first letter 
of the, of the first session and the second letter of the second session. I hope that made sense to people. The five topics um, are list, should be, yep, they're listed on the screen behind me. Um, they are enhancing personal health and well-being. Um, this is the breakout group. We want to understand how health is defined and what information helps to motivate people to take better care of themselves. The second breakout, using data to create and sustain healthy communities, will focus on how you define and connect with your community. We really want to understand what information is needed to create healthier and well communities. Um, the third is improving population health. We've talked a lot about population health today, um, which will explore the elements um, that are needed to create healthier communities outside of health. And that's really what Daniel talked about um, as we were wrapping up the questions. And it talks about access to healthy foods, walkable and bikeable neighborhoods, good air quality, those social services, um, those social determinants of health. And I like to describe social determinants of health as where we live, learn, work, play, and pray. It's about life um, and, and everything that goes around our lives. Um, the next one is engaging people and communities to improve everyone's health. Um, this breakout, the discussion will focus on data um, what data motivates people to take care of their health. And the last session is working together and sharing information to improve health. And that will explore how information is communicated and shared at all levels to improve health and what improvements can be made to better share information. Um, so all of these things are really interconnected and cut across all the different levels. We've talked on the individual level, the community level, the health system level, and the population level and when we talk about population it's not just the healthcare panel it's really all of those people in a community um, and just so you know that we'll go by Chatham House rules um, that means that everyone can use information that was discussed today but identify um, if you want to identify um, participants um, you have to ask them but the identity of participants will n in general not be revealed um, in any sort of reporting and printout. Um, there are two handouts that we've provided. One is on the demographics of health in San Francisco to give you a sense of the region, and I hope you guys have had a chance to look at it. And then the other handout provides health information concepts and definitions to really help us with framing the discussion. But you'll have facilitators in the room who will also play a role in um, helping sort of frame the discussion that we're going to have. Um, and you'll have the opportunity to participate in, in two of the five breakout sessions. Um, the first one will last from 11 to 12.30, and the second one will be after lunch from 1 to 2.30. And then after that, we'll, um, we'll, come, af we'll come back and we'll have lunch. And um, then we'll, after lunch, then we'll come and have the second session. And then after the second session, we'll have a little bit of a break, but then we'll ask everyone to come in. And we'll have note takers who will be coming around the room, and then we'll do sort of a wrap up of what's been heard in all of the different sessions to give people an opportunity to sort of get a sense of what was said, not just in the rooms that you were in, but also in the rooms in which you didn't get a chance to participate. Okay. Thank you. So at this point, I think we will take a quick break, and then everyone will go into their breakout sessions. Thank you.